This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. We are praying that the newfound peace come to stay and Boko Haram should never attack us or disturb us anymore. That's a Nigerian truck driver, Said Bukhar, who was among scores of civilians watching Cameroon's official reopening of three border markets that had been closed for nearly a year by Boko Haram militants. Details coming up. Also, some Christian leaders in Nigeria want security officers deployed at all places of worship. A prominent dissident in Equatorial Guinea has died in prison. And scientists say ocean temperatures have hit a new record. All these and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Al-Shabaab launched a deadly complex attack on a Somali military base today, just a day after the government claimed a historic victory over the jihadists. To brief us more on the matter, we have standing by on the phone uh, VOA's Somali Service uh, Senior Editor, Harun Maruf. Uh, welcome to Africa News tonight, Harun. Thank you, Yehaya. So there were conflicting reports about the death toll after the Islamist fighters uh, stormed the camp in the town, I believe, uh, Hawadli, north of the capital Mogadishu. Uh, could you fill us on that? Yeah, there was a major attack by al-Shabaab this morning on a military base in Hawadli. That's about 75 kilometers north of Mogadishu. Al-Shabaab is... Uh, tactic is they usually start their attacks with explosions from vehicles, car bombs, and then they storm the military base. And that's what they have been doing for many years. They did the same thing this morning. Uh, we understand that during the fighting, a number of soldiers were killed as well as militants. The government's official line is that five soldiers were killed, including a senior military commander uh, who was at the base. And the government also claims that it killed 21 militants and repulsed the attack. Al-Shabaab on their side, they claim that they killed 63 government uh, soldiers. And also they claim they confiscated military vehicles and ammunition. It's always very difficult to verify casualty figures that are coming from the two sides. And uh, one thing... uh uh, you know, last Saturday, eight people were killed in a roadside bomb being claimed by al-Shabaab in central Somalia. Earlier this month, 19 people were killed in twin car bombings in Mahas, a town in Hiran district in the Hir uh, And President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed has declared an all-out war on the jihadists after taking office in May last year. But despite all this, uh, Harun al-Shabaab seems to be demonstrating the ability to strike back with lethal force against civilians and military targets. Uh, yeah, what al-Shabaab has been doing is they have been carrying out retaliatory attacks. What we know is that the military offensive that has been taking place since August has dislodged al-Shabaab from vast areas in the countryside. The government had, and local uh, forces have been taking over towns, villages. So far, the government says it seized more than 70 uh, localities. Uh, yesterday, we learned that government captured two key towns in Gelmuruk state. Today, the government reported capturing another coastal town. So the government forces are advancing. Uh, without meeting any significant resistance from the militants. But the militants on their side, they are uh, hiding in the forests, and then they are isolating uh, forward operating bases, and they carry out these deadly attacks. On the other hand, they are sending uh, car bombs into major urban areas so that they can exactly revenge on local communities who are mobilizing themselves to support uh, the federal government forces. So the attacks you mentioned now are part of those series of retaliatory attacks by al-Shabaab. 
So, and lastly, uh, Harun, uh, the government, like you said, is making gains. Uh, what is the end game for the government, and what is the strategy of Al Shabab? Uh, the government is long-term plan, uh, according to the government officials, the president himself, is to liberate, as they put it, eliminate Al Shabab uh, from Somalia. They wanted to expand it, the areas in the country that the government controls, and they wanted to, to, to drive out the militants, either force them uh, to surrender or get rid of them. That is the long-term plan. But on the other hand, we know that uh, Al-Shabaab has been in Somalia for 15 years. Uh, during this period, they have not had uh, similar military offenses uh, that seriously jeopardized or weakened their authority. They have been recruiting rigorously. They have been uh, sophisticating their capabilities. Um, and they are very... Uh, they have got a lot of men. And as I just mentioned earlier, they are not putting up a lot of pressure. That's because they are withdrawing and they are trying to save their men for a big fight in the South. The government at the moment is carrying out this offensive in the central regions. They wanted to remove al Shabaab from the central region, and then they wanted to turn their attention to the south. The south will be more difficult because it has a lot of forests, a lot of jungles, a lot of valleys. It's going to be very difficult militarily to uh, completely get rid of that, but that's the long-term plan of the government. But al Shabaab also wanted to save their men for that big fight in the south. POA's Somali Service Senior Editor Harun Maruf, thank you for your input. During a visit to Libya last week, the head of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, William Burns, warned against compromising all ports and fields and urged cooperation in a divided country to protect the critical sector. Burns met separately with the Prime Minister of the Unity Government, Abdul Hamid Dabiba, in Tripoli, and with General Khalif Haftar in Benghazi. He stressed that the current phase in the battered country must be transitional and away from any parallel political tracks. Burns said the United States stresses the need to stabilize Libya's oil sector and not stop its exports, as has happened before. Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, discussed Burns' meetings with VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi. I fully agree that there must not be any parallel political tracks or government in Libya, but I doubt that the Dabeba government or the government of his rival Fatih Bashaga are able to lead Libya to elections. Nevertheless, if there are two governments, two political tracks in Libya, it will be next to impossible to organize serious elections. Regarding the oil sector, while there is certainly no way that Russia is able to make up for Russian oil exports to the West, especially to Western Europe, Libya is still a very significant producer. And consequently, in this part of the American-Russian containment policy, and in order to reboost global economy, a stable Libyan oil production is, of course, in the American interest. But I would say the very best way to protect the country's oil sector and to ensure that there are no oil blockades anymore would be to ensure that everyone in Libya benefits from its oil bed, which is currently not the case. The people in the East and in the South consider blockades as a means of last resort to achieve this, to get their share from the oil revenues. And this should be also understood in the United States and in Europe. But according to news reports, Burns warned during his meeting with General Hutton against compromising oil ports and fields. He said the United States stresses the need to stabilize Libya's oil sector and not stop its exports as has happened in previous times. Would the general have to respect such a U.S. position? Yes, Burns certainly addressed this topic. And Hefta is still very influential in Libya's east, but I doubt that he has still the power to switch the oil production on and off as he wants. And he is certainly not able to do so in the south, in the sun. The disadvantaged population in the east, disadvantage is least in compared with the cities of Tripoli and Misrata, and especially in the south, is so disappointed, so disappointed from the lack of political progress, from all these discussions about upcoming elections and postponing elections and constitutions and frustrated about that dire situation that the renewed oil blockade is a real possibility and such a decision does not need Khalifa Haftar. This could be easily made as it was also the case at times in the past by local leaders especially by the influential tribal leaders.
and I would not bet that Hefter would have the power to stop them from doing so, even if he would want to do so. But I don't expect him to act against the will of the tribal leaders anyway, even if this would annoy Washington. As such a move against the tribal leaders could easily undermine his own position. Weber told the United States intelligence official that his government had a plan to increase oil exports to 3 million barrels per day over the next three years. Is that feasible and would that result in a more support for the Weber government? Such a statement from Prime Minister the Weber sounds certainly perfect in the ears of many in the United States and especially of many more in Europe. But even if one assumes that the situation in Libya in general and in Fezzan in particular would stabilize, really stabilize and remain stable over the next years, this would be extremely challenging from a technical point of view. Please keep in mind, the oil production is currently at about 1.2 million barrels per day. The highest oil production in Libya so far was in 2006 with just 1.75 million barrels per day. Before the revolution, it was at 1.65 million barrels per day. Today, Libya's oil infrastructure is in a quite bad shape. There is a lack of maintenance, or pipelines are leaking, new wells need to be drilled as several of the older ones are drying out. Altogether, this would need a much higher level of foreign investment and also much more foreign expertise in Libya to sustain and increase the current production in a moderate way. I would say an increase to 3 million barrels per day within three years is not very realistic, and the United States certainly knows about this. That was uh, Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El Shanawi. For the first time in a decade, Cameroon has reopened markets and schools sealed by Boko Haram terrorists on its northern border with Chad and Nigeria. Cameroonian authorities say peace and safety has returned to the area after security forces pushed out the Islamist militants. Civilians who returned to the area are calling on the government to rebuild destroyed buildings and homes. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Photocall Cameroon. A group of 35 male flutists welcomed Cameroonian federal and local officials Monday to Photocall on the northern border with Chad and Nigeria for the reopening of three border markets. Photocall is just across the El Bied Ebeji River from Gamburu, a town in Nigeria's northeast Bono State, the best place of the terrorist group Boko Haram. Officials say Photocall's markets and schools were forced to shut down in 2015 after the Islamist militants killed about 20 traders. 39 year old Aminatu Hayatu is a chief council revenue collector at Photocall's Sangme Market. <laughs> she says she is very delighted that after so many years of Boko Haram atrocities, peace has returned to Photocall and she has resumed work at Sangme Market. Hayatu says people now move in and out of their houses doing their business during the day and at night without fear of attacks by terrorists. She says civilians, including merchants, travel to both sides of the borders between Cameroon, Chad, and Nigeria without fear. Cameroon authorities say they are reopening 15 more markets and scores of schools sealed for more than a decade due to Boko Haram attacks along the border. Officials say Boko Haram started raids in Photocall in 2010, with the deadliest coming in 2015, when the militants killed at least 70 people, torched hundreds of homes, and forced more than 2,000 people to flee. Cameroon's government says Chadian troops helped push Boko Haram out of Photocall, killing at least 150 of the militants. Authorities say the area is now safe for schools to reopen and for trading to resume. For the two-year-old Nigerian truck driver Said Bukar was among scores of civilians watching Monday's official reopening 
of the three border markets. Transportation between Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad has been resolved. The road is open and there has been peace for over five months now. So we are doing our transaction presently. Everything is okay now. We are praying that the newfound peace come to stay and Boko Haram should never attack us or disturb us anymore. Cameroon supplies cereals, including millets and corn to Nigeria, while Nigeria supplies 80% of Cameroon's basic commodities. Cameroon's government says almost a third of those traded goods pass through Fotokor. Cameroon last May deployed troops to northern villages and towns after daily protests at government offices over increasing Boko Haram attacks. The government says there have been no large Boko Haram attacks since. Civilians returning to markets and schools are now calling on Cameroon's government to rebuild infrastructure the militants destroyed. Von Bele Matthias Tayem is the highest ranking official in Logon and Shari, a border administrative unit of Kolofata, where some of the protests took place. Tayem says the government of Cameroon wants first to boost trade and reduce poverty in rural areas by rehabilitating roads linking Cameroon, Chad and Nigeria that were destroyed by more than 10 years of Boko Haram terrorism. Although peace has returned to Cameroon's northern border with Chad and Nigeria, he says Cameroon's military should continue to be on the alert because Boko Haram is seriously weakened but not totally defeated. The Nigerian militants began launching attacks in 2009 to try to impose hardline Islamist rule in northeast Nigeria. The attacks soon extended into Cameroon, Chad, and Niger. The United Nations says the conflict has since killed 350,000 people in Nigeria, made at least 330,000 others into refugees, and internally displaced more than 3 million. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VON News, Kolofata, Cameroon. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm your host, Yehiyas Wuhib, in Washington. The Christian Association of Nigeria, or CAN, in Niger State, is calling for the deployment of security officers at all places of worship, including churches and mosques. This, after condemning the killing by gunmen of Father Isaac Achi, a Catholic priest, on Sunday morning. Local media reports say, failing to gain access to Father Achi's home, the attackers set it on fire, killing him and wounded another priest who tried to escape. For more on the call for protection by the Christian Association of Nigeria, VOA's Peter Cloti reached uh, out to Daniel Atori. He's the spokesperson for CAN in Niger State. The Christian Association of Nigeria uh, strongly condemned the act carried out by these uh, bandits. It's something that we don't want to happen again. We are calling for a thorough investigation into the whole uh, incident because they were attacked in the wee hours of yesterday, as early as 1 a.m., between 1 and 2 a.m., while uh, people were sleeping. They attacked them, burned down the parish, and killed the, the priest. The one who survived uh, had to uh, escape with uh, bullet wounds. And so... We are calling on the, the government, both at federal and state level. We're also calling on uh, the police, the security agencies, all relevant stakeholders to take up this because we want to get to the, uh, I mean, the end of this whole thing. What has been the response of the state government and the police in Niger State? The commissioner of police uh, visited uh, the site yesterday and uh, what the commissioner said he's very welcoming. According to him, uh, his men are already uh, uh, have been dispatched to uh, Fisher the Afterland. And then the, the government of the state, uh, the governor condemned the act. Uh, as a matter of fact, a statement was released also where he said the, the perpetrators should be booked. And our endless prayer is that investigations are carried out 
and then those who are responsible for this wanton killing are be brought to book to serve as deterrent to others who may have uh, such uh, nefarious uh, uh, mindset. Were there any assurances issued by the police and by the state government about ensuring the protection of, of life and property? Well, uh, the state government uh, are previously have been doing that. You know, there was a time we had attacks. Uh, attacks were coming almost every week in the state. Uh, for some time now, the whole thing had relapsed, and uh, it seems like the government went, not that they went to sleep, but the same deal they were using at this time, and they slacked because we have entered the political era. So most of the security agencies that are supposed to protect lives and properties are now working with politicians. However, they gave assurance that the lives of people, residents, will be protected. At the time, that was uh, during the youth tide, December last month, a uh, directive was given that uh, security agencies would be uh, situated in church or worship centers, either mosques or uh, churches. And uh, that has been the practice all along. However, that we need a strong commitment from the government that all parishes, all churches, all worship centers, security operators be assigned to these places. That will give assurances to worshippers and residents. Well, since Khan is making the call, will there be a follow-up to ensure that uh, security operatives or police are deployed? Yes, uh, uh, Khan will definitely do that. Hopefully, we Khan is going to meet very soon. Um, the executive members already put here together, knowing fully that the a uh, priest that was killed uh, is the Khan coordinator in his local government. That is Paikoro local government. So uh, that means he's an ESCO member at the local government uh, level. Uh, Khan is doing everything possible, and Khan is going to meet. Uh, I can't tell you when exactly, but uh, we are trying to put things together to see that we'll meet. And then these are some of the things we want to discuss. It's not just saying it. We need strong commitment from the government and from security agencies because we can't afford to lose life, innocent lives. People who are adding value to, to the society, you know, can't definitely will take it up because these must stop. We are making a strong statement to the government and to the security agencies. How will this stop? If we have security agencies that are manning these worship centers, will either mosque or churches, but most especially uh, churches or worship centers that are in the rural areas, uh, that will give confidence to worshipers to go worship their gods. So I'm very, very sure about that. Uh, it's one of the things uh, the body of Christ will going to discuss uh, in a few uh, hours and a few days from now. VOA's Peter Cloti talking to Daniela Tori from the Christian Association of Nigeria. Pope Francis today sent condolences to victims of a church bombing in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The Associated Press says the attack in the North Kivu province town of Kasindi on Sunday killed at least 14 people and injured 60. The Islamic State group says it detonated the bomb while people were praying. Pope Francis is due to arrive in the DRC on January 31st for a three-day visit. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa's office has announced that he will not attend the World Economic Forum in Switzerland so he can hold talks with state-owned energy company ESCOM and political leaders. This week, the troubled power supplier announced it would implement load shedding or blackouts for nearly half a day and blamed broken generators, sabotage and crime. Critics blame corruption for the company's failure to maintain equipment and provide services. Ramaphosa has been expected to attend the Swiss Forum to promote investments in South Africa, the continent's most industrialized country. And that wraps up this edition of Africa News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in